Software Engineering Radio Episode 28 Type Systems. This episode we are going to talk about typing uh, and this is due to the fact that we've talked about typing already quite a lot in um, in the episode about scripting languages for example so we figured that it's better to do uh, an episode about typing exclusively you mean and typing as in programming language types not as in hitting keys on the keyboard yeah precisely so uh, the first question is why should we care about typing You mean, why should we care about typing? Yeah, and uh, one of the reasons is because uh, the types uh, define the expressiveness of the programming languages, uh, of a programming language, and uh, define what you can actually do there. Uh, the other thing is um, that is also related to the scripting episode, uh, scripting languages episode. Dynamically typed languages gain more focus recently. And also, functional languages uh, gain more focus. It's um, sort of um, away from uh, statically typed languages, object-oriented languages, towards other different um, models. And especially, functional languages have a different and arguably better typing system. Um, yeah, and the other reason for thinking about this is uh, related to DSLs, and I think that is something that you are honored have to say something about. Yeah, I mean, it is. There's a great range of languages that you can use off the shelf that you you have compilers that you have tools for, like C, C++, Java, Smalltalk, Ruby, or scripting languages, whatever, and they've got different type systems and good to understand the issues of type systems and of typing in order to choose the right language for the job, but then also writing your own languages, domain-specific languages, is becoming more and more important. And so more and more developers find themselves in a situation where they are, where they, where they actually design their own programming language and are faced with the challenge of designing their own type system for this language. And this is becoming more and more important. It's, def it's not really mainstream yet, but it's getting there. And for that, it is quite important to, or at least very, very helpful to have an understanding of what type systems are all about. So you know what to do and what not to do, how to scope your type system if you write your own programming language. And uh, the first question, of course, is what a type actually is. And um, the definition of a type is basically um, it's a set of values and operators that work on them. So for example, uh, integers uh, together with the usual mathematical operations such as uh, addition or um, multiplication uh, can be considered a type. Which is actually um, quite an interesting example because for an integer, The operations are well defined. There's consensus as to what the operations do and more or less consensus as to what operations there should be. But um, different languages have different ranges of values for an integer. I think you yeah. were just getting to that. Yeah, and uh, I mean, uh, the, the mathematical concept of an integer is not really limited in size. It just says it's um, a, a number And that's it. Um, and uh, this is a problem that that uh, type systems have. Generally speaking, they are not so clear in uh, in in what they can express. And uh, sometimes uh, even databases, for example, are better because they, for example, uh, offer strings with limited length, which is not so uh, useful in or, or it's not used in uh, normal programming languages like Java, for example. And um, also the problem of validation of uh, data is often rather a type issue uh, if it was done correctly. So for example, uh, the question really is, um, can you uh, pass this, str the question of can you pass this string into a date 
is really a type issue. It's an issue of uh, how this string looks like and uh, if you can't express that in the type system of the language, which you usually can't, uh, then you have to code something yourself and that's a validation. And the same is true for limited ranges of certain numbers and so on. That's all stuff that uh, could be put into the typing system while it's usually uh, done in the validation code. Yeah, for example, if you want to store the name of a person, you usually use a string. But what you really want is sort of a name type. And this name type has constraints as to the characters that can be in it, as to the a minimum length, maybe a maximum length. And logic, what you conceptually want is to have a name type, you just use the technical type string and have validation to enforce these constraints building on, on a string. So you have a, so, some sort of a name type. And typing counts in different flavors. Uh, so there is the distinction between strong and weak typing. So strong typing means that uh, typing is really enforced. So you can't, you can only do operations on certain types if they are allowed. Uh, and weak typing means that this is basically unchecked. So for example, in uh, C, a pointer in C uh, is weakly typed because uh, it is not really, you, you cannot really be sure whether the memory location that uh, the C pointer points to is really uh, the type that you expect. So you say this is a pointer to a character and you assume that it is actually a character that is stored there and it still works even though if uh, there is an integer that is stored there. And the other distinction is between dynamically typed languages and statically typed languages. So dynamically typed language does the type check at runtime, while statically typed language does the type check at compile time. And real languages like C++, for example, are somewhere in between there. And Java is another example of a language that is somehow in between there. Yeah, an example for a dynamically typed language, for a purely dynamically typed language would be Smalltalk, where you basically have all but well, you basically have no type checks at all at compile time and you can send any message to any object and if it understands this message it can handle it and at the end, other end of the spectrum would be a really strongly typed, statically typed language um, the strongest language that comes to my mind would be Haskell, a functional language that is becoming more and more mainstream which does not have the concept of type casts and does a lot with type inference with type derivation but anyway you can any any program that can be expressed and passes the the compile time checks is um, sound from the perspective of the type system the language does not permit any, um, any that you write anything that would um, lead to a type mismatch at runtime and um, as we said Java for example is in between those so even though Java is considered a statically typed language, this is not the whole truth because due to the fact that you can have class casts, there is still a way of uh, tweaking the type system into accepting some code that it can't prove correct. And this is quite common, uh, for example, for collections before JDK 1.5, you had to typecast the results of the collection or the content of a collection to a concrete type and uh, you couldn't statically check whether this re re uh, this type uh, cast will really succeed. Uh, so it's somewhere in between. Um, you still get uh, class cast exceptions in some areas, but a lot of stuff is checked already at compile time. And it is a strongly typed language because you get class cast exceptions, which means that you can't just get um, a string out of uh, a collection that only contains integers uh, and do an error there. So that's detected. Yeah, actually, in the Java language specification terminology, there is the distinction between reference types and object types. The object type is the actual type of the object, sort of a certain location in memory that represents the data of an object has a specific type, but then there is the reference that points to this location in memory, and 
um, they, those two need not have the same type. For example, if we have an array list in memory, which is a specific collection class in Java, the reference that points to this array list can be of type array list or of type list, which is a super type, or of type object, which is the super type of all types in Java. So there, there is this distinction, and at runtime, only the object type is used for type checks, and if the object type does not match, you get a class cast exception if you try to, to cast. The comp um, compiler only knows about reference types. So all checks are that are done by the compiler are based on the reference type, and if you do a class if you do a type cast, the reference type is changed, whereas the object type remains the same. On the other hand, there are operations that actually change the object type. For example, boxing or unboxing, that is primitive types are wrapped in objects or unwrapped, or the widening of a type. If you pass an int to a method that expects a long, then there is an implicit conversion of the int to the long. That actually changes the object type. So Java is a hybrid language that has concepts from both worlds and, well, it's a pragmatic compromise that works somewhat well, but it's a mix of both concepts. Historically, uh, typing was uh, a rather technical term. As we already said, it's um, now more or less about proving that a program is correct in terms of the typing so that you can have at least a certain a uh, check on the program or a proof on the program, while historically it was rather related to memory allocation. So you could say, okay, a byte is 8 bits and an integer is 16 bits and a long is 32 bits and so on. And in languages like C or C++, this was even dependent on the platform. So uh, depending on which platform you run on, the types have s uh, different different precision and sizes. And this, in Java, for example, it's uh, machine independent, but it's still technology driven. So the integer is still somewhat technology driven because it's limited to a certain range of values, but it is, and it doesn't cover the, the real concept of an integer that is, can be of arbitrary size. Yeah, actually, this... actually, historically, there were both both trends. The one was the C kind of language that is close to the machine, sort of next step beyond assembly language. But then in the 50s, which is very early for a programming language, when Lisp was first thought of, there was the concept of an unlimited range integer type. So both concepts actually go ba back quite a way and only recently have become have come closer together due to more powerful machines that did not make it or make it less and less necessary for mainstream programming to be strict about performance optimization. And uh, this was also the grandfather of all those functional programming languages, so that's sort of the reason why typing systems are better there. Speaking of functions, functions, procedures and methods and so on can also be assigned to type. And that's rather easy because you can say the type of a function is defined by the type of its parameters and the type of the return value. So you could say, okay, this function takes an integer and a string and returns a long, and this, this is the type of the function. It's a function that takes those two types of parameters and returns a different type. And exceptions can be seen as a possible return type. Uh, so you could say instead of an integer, this method might as well return an exception. And you mean you return? Ex this, you mean return an exception by throwing it? Yeah, exactly. And if you take this approach, you could argue that uh, strong typing means that you have to use checked exceptions because strong typing means that you must know. Uh, which kind of return values you can expect from the function. One kind of return value that you could expect is an exception. So therefore you need to have this specifically in uh, the signature of the method and you need to take care about 
those strict exceptions. That's actually quite an interesting point, and I'd like to point our readers to the exception handling episode 2, which goes a little bit into these sort of issues of what different sorts of exceptions there are and whether to declare them, make them, they make them explicit or not. Mm. But what, you, what you're describing is sort of the um, design by contract approach. A very strict approach that says every possible outcome of a method needs to be defined in the contract of the method. Um, every, um, the, the preconditions that must be met by the caller and the postconditions that the method guarantees and one of the possible um, outcomes is that the method throws an exception, it needs to be documented. That is one valid way of designing, definitely, it's very helpful and very useful, but it does not enforce checked exceptions from from my perspective because, um, well, first of all, very few languages have checked exceptions per se. I mean, Java has them and it's more or less the only language that has checked exceptions. And you can, even if you don't have checked exceptions, you can describe it in the API documentation or wherever to say, under certain circumstances, this or that exception will be thrown. And then there are lots of exceptions that can be thrown more or less everywhere, like invalid parameter exception or this pointer was a null and I don't want that, that sort of thing. And they are sort of implicitly part of the contract of more or less any method indicating that there was some sort of bug. And there are yeah. lots of, 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 of situations in between. I don't think we should really go into that because we had de dealt with that at length in the exception handling 2 episode. But checked exceptions are quite ambivalent and you don't really need them to have this sort of contract. Yeah, and, but uh, this is probably the reason why Ch uh, Java came up with checked exceptions. Whether this is a good idea is, as you said, beyond this, the, what we talk about in this episode. Yeah, exactly. Functions can have a type, functions can be passed around as parameters, functions can be partly evaluated often, and then you have a partly evaluated function that can be, around, can be passed around further, but many mainstream object-oriented languages do not have this concept. I think we should mention that, that Although it is conceptually a type, Java or, yeah, well, anyway, Java and C-sharp do not have this concept of passing around methods. Um, in C++, we have something, or in C, we have something like that with function pointers, which is not quite the same as in functional languages, but it's, it goes some way. So, yeah, this is conceptually very true, and it's a very powerful concept of functional languages, but mainstream OO languages currently don't have it. Even though, for example, inner classes in, in uh, Java, for example, can be used uh, for things that you would usually use functions for. The the interesting part of is, is assigning a function a type is that you can now do more fancy stuff like uh, having a, parameter, a function as a parameter because you can talk about the type of the function and therefore declare uh, parameters of that type and so on. So that's sort of yeah. the, the, the stream. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, I mean, uh, the, the mathematical concept of an yeah, integer. Yeah, it's, it's not very really powerful. Actually, I was just, just it's, thinking maybe we should um, do an episode yeah. on functional programming languages. I think it's definitely worth another episode. Yeah, absolutely. And this is sort of. The, the, this typing episode, I think, is probably groundwork for, for this thing. So speaking about, so one thing you could do that we just discussed is uh, assign functions a type. One other thing that you can do is to get more advanced typing stuff is you could define abstract data types. What's that? The, the idea here is that instead of having a type that it has certain values and certain operations that can work on those values, the values uh, somehow disappear. So you are just talking about operations more or less. So operations become the most important part. This sounds um, like the concept of encapsulation. Yeah, exactly. That's that's basically the idea. So and that's why it's also why it's called abstract data types. So you say it's there is a certain hidden thing inside this abstract data type that isn't exported to the rest of the world. 
And the only thing that is exported to the rest of the world are the operations that you can do on this type. And therefore, it's called abstract data types. And that's sort of the fundamental for object orientation and object oriented languages. That sounds like this is the reason why it is considered good practice to have private attributes and define get and set methods of some kind to access these attributes, even though they are implemented in the straightforward way and they are always the same, and just change the attribute or return the value of the attribute. Yeah, exactly. That's well, one of the ideas. But is, it, is that worth it, to actually have these get and set methods that basically do nothing? It's, this is specific to a language. I mean, it's, uh, if you do it the the C sharp way, for example, this problem more or less disappears because uh, syntactically you can't tell whether you're actually calling a get method or whether you are really accessing uh, an attribute itself. It's not so important for typical uh, data containers and that's why to a certain extent there is a problem nowadays because often you see systems that are composed of services and data containers more or less that don't have much logic in them themselves and uh, this leads to sort of uh, the the opposite of abstract data types so you are now separating logic in services from those data containers and that that's somehow not what uh, this abstract data type and OO stuff is about. But it's still a very valid approach because, for example, in service-oriented architectures or widely distributed architectures, you want to have data containers that can be passed around without any logic because you really want to have those structures that can be used in client-server communication, for example. But originally, the idea was different and the, the original idea was to have to, to focus more on uh, the operations and uh, the stuff that you can do with it. So the, the key point of abstract data types is, from what I understood you just, just said, is that you want to have data hiding, information hiding, you want to have encapsulation, you distinguish between the public interface of a type, the things that are available to the outside, sort of the API of the type, and the insides that can be changed in any way and nobody on the, on the outside can know what the inside looks like or should know. Sort of separation, people can use the, op the type and not bother with the implementation of the type, with the concrete type. And this already leads to a certain problem in this area uh, because the abstract data type is not really a type because it just it doesn't just define the operations that you can run on the type, but it also gives a concrete implementation most of the time. And this is also You mean a concrete programming programming language type like a class is not an abstract data type in this sense. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's a mixture especially in, in uh, now object oriented uh, languages of nowadays, uh, this class that you, are t uh, that you are implementing is a type because it defines certain operations, which is the public interface most of the time. And it also defines something more, the implementation. So therefore, class is not really a type. An interface is more like a type. That's basically what it comes down to. What, which is actually a not so old concept in programming languages. I mean, looking at C++, C++ does not have, which is one of the older um, object-oriented languages, does not have the concept of an interface. You can have workarounds like pure virtual classes, but they're not first class members of the, of the concepts of the language, really. So we're talking about younger languages mostly, like Java or C Sharp. When you were saying, when we were distinguishing between classes and interfaces. Yeah. And the next thing that you can bring up, of course, is inheritance, or in terms of, of types, rather subtyping. And the rule for subtyping is that everything the type can be used for, the type is the subtype can be used for as well. And you can do additional things. So, for example, you could say uh, there is a uh, there is a type a person with attributes such as name or first name 
And you could say there is a subtype that is a customer, and a customer just adds some behavior and some additional data, like for example, a rating that you're giving to the customer. And then everything that works on a person should also work on a customer. Uh, so you could add more specific things, but you must be able to use the subtype everywhere where the type itself is used. Yeah, I think this is a very powerful concept and it's very important to get, have a clear understanding of this when you des design actual systems because it, um, it's very dangerous to just sort of arbitrarily change the semantics of, of operation calls if you do subtyping. But then um, playing devil's advocate, I think it is there's, there are situations, especially if you have some sort of API evolution of a system that is maintained over a longer time, uh, when you sort of define a type early on, publish that, and then want to have special situations where you want to change the semantics of the calls. That happened in, for example, in the Java collection classes. There is the concept of, let's say, a map, which is a, an associative array. You have keys and you have values. And you can put values in there, you can retrieve them, you can delete them. And then later on, in a later edition of Java, some of these operations were declared optional, so that not all implementations needed to provide implementations for them. And then, in an even later version of the collection API, a new implementation was provided that compared objects not based on equality, that is, well, comparing their values, this it becomes very Java-specific, you can have a method equal that compares two objects, and this new implementation compares the object not based on these equals implementation, equality operation, but on object identity, which sort of breaks every contract. But it's still very often useful to have the same interface map for both. So I would argue that it's very important to have this concept of subtyping clear in your mind, but then be pragmatic about breaking these sort of constraints when you do subtyping, if you know what you're doing, yeah, I think the, the, the real pr issue probably is uh, here is that you have something out there, which is an interface to system, more or less, and it's out there and widely, really wide, widely used. And then basically there is no way of uh, ever changing it. And that's also the reason why deprecated methods uh, in Java will never ever really disappear in the JDK because you, you can't really pay the effort of migrating away from those deprecated methods. Yeah, I'm afraid you're and, right there. Yeah, so basically this is sort of related to the problem that the widely used interface can not ever be changed. And that's also something that is, for example, an issue in service-oriented architectures or web services or things like that. So yeah. Talking about uh, subtyping, so you already gave sort of an example of uh, a subtype for object-oriented uh, systems, which is somehow related to uh, inheritance. So you could argue that inheritance uh, should, on the interface level, be subtyping. This leads to the question uh, what you can do about the methods. So... You mean if you have a, an abstract type that defines methods, that defines operations, and you have a subtype, and what possible things can change in the in the methods in the operations of the abstract type if you do subtyping. Yeah, exactly. In inheritance, what does that mean for methods? And the other question, more generally speaking, uh, also talking about uh, functional languages, you could talk about a subtype of functions. So you say there is a certain type of function that takes certain parameters as types of parameters and returns a certain type and now you want to have a subtype of this function, what does that look like? It's basically the same thing, whether you have methods in classes and do inheritance there, or whether you want to do subclassing in terms of functions. Yeah. And what you can, and because you, you still need to be able to use the subtype everywhere, this, uh, the type itself can be used. This leads to the following, the parameters the constraints of the parameters can be relaxed. So that way, 
uh, even though you you think you have the type itself, you can still satisfy the constraints of the subtype because it can only relax the constraints of the types. So every time you uh, satisfy the constraints of the type itself, you will also uh, satisfy the constraints of the subtype. And for the return value, you, you can have more constraints. So every time you expect a return value of the type itself, you can also deal with uh, the, the subtype. You're, you're, and, speaking, you're speaking conceptually now of, um, yeah. of, of the things that are possible from the perspective of abstract data types and specialization of abstract data types. You're not speaking about, uh, about concrete programming languages right now yet. It's at the conceptual yeah, level, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so, so it basically comes down to the fact that a function that uh, takes a person uh, and returns a person, a subtype of that function might take an arbitrary object, for example, as a parameter, and may re so it relaxes the constraints for the parameters, and it might return a more specific type as a return type. So, for example, it might return a customer instead of a person. Java does not allow this. Unfortunately, there are other languages that permit this sort of thing. So, concrete programming languages provide less than the the abstract concept of abstract data types would permit them to do. And um, the other thing that is also quite interesting is uh, parametric, parametric types as an advanced type uh, thing. So there, you mean the different kinds of specializing types. One is sort of subtyping and the other is to, in the supertype, to sort of define a parameter that can make several types out of one type. I would argue that those concepts are really orthogonal, so uh, they are independent of each other. So I would say that exactly as you can have as you can have parameters to functions, you can also have parameters to types. And uh, that's it basically. So and it does not having a parameter to a type does not necessarily mean that every time you have a different type as a concrete type as a parameter uh, you get a new type somewhere so basically the idea first of all is uh, to say for example for collections there is not just a collection of an object or whatever but rather a collection of persons or uh, customers or whatever and so for this you need to have some means of defining that a list can have uh, a type parameter and some means to say uh, in this in this uh, piece of code I want to have a list that only contains persons or whatever. Mm -hmm. And as we already mentioned uh, concerning static and dynamic typing, for static typing to actually really work, you need to have in place, parametric, parametric, uh, parametric types, types because, because otherwise you can't talk about collections and type safe collections. So you will always have sort of a type leak in the system where you do dynamically typed stuff. Well, not necessarily. If you, you can have things like type inference, but may, most languages don't have that. So for, for practical purposes, yeah. you're right. And we'll talk about type inference just in a few minutes, I think. The interesting part is how uh, parametric types are implemented. So the one that I'm uh, best familiar with is uh, Java, and in that case uh, it's done with um, something that they call type erasure. So at runtime in the uh, bytecode the type is not really present anymore. And instead, there are just type casts at the right location. So if you say there is a list of person, then every time you take an object out of the list, uh, it's type cast to a person. And uh, the type checker at compile time checks whether everything is okay with your code, but it's not present at runtime anymore. Yeah, and so this leads, this leads to the problem that, for example, with reflection. Uh, it's 
hard to really get the current hype that is in the list or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this um, using the terminology that we introduced of the Java language specification, the object type is knows nothing about um, parametric types. So the object types of a list of strings and of a list of persons is the same. It's just in the reference types, they're present at compile time only. So it's just about compile time checks and typecasts that are introduced. But then there is the another approach um, that is fundamentally different. For example, C++ has this, which makes param param uh, parameterized types sort of a template that um, is from which a concrete type is made for every different type that is passed as a parameter. In C++, it's just a macro expansion mechanism, so the compiler actually compiles the class with a different type passed in, creates different object files for them, and this is can, can, be, can become really big. There are more elegant, more efficient approaches than that, but nonetheless it is sort of the real type approach. If you have a parametric type in C++, for every parameter you pass in, for every different parameter, you get a n real type, a really different type that has, from the programming language perspective, no relation at all to the type with different parameters passed in. Yeah, and uh, in C Sharp, the type information is actually contained in the code for the common language runtime. So it's, again, different and there is just one implementation, but that implementation takes uh, into account the type of meter itself. Mm -hmm. But talking about reflection, we, so far we talked about the perspective of the compiler and of the runtime environment um, to types. And we have this sort of static types that are available to the compiler, and we have sort of dynamic types that is dynamic type information that is available to the runtime environment to make type checks. But um, going a step beyond that, we have things like reflection that make type information available to the program, to the programmer and to the programming language and to the program at runtime as well, which allows them to, well, in the simplest case, read type information. We have that in Java, for example. So in Java we have possi the possibility to ask an object what is your type, what, is you, what are your methods, or your operations, what are the fields that are declared, what are the supertypes. So we have read access to the type structure. And using reflection we can invoke an operation or we can read a field, read the value of a field or set the value of a field. This is sort of a at, at odds with having abstract data types, with having encapsulation, because it allows access to all the private internal details of a, of a type, but it's still a very powerful tool for f dealing with, with object structures, to, for dealing with types in a really generic way. Having code that can read or write or create objects just based on their name information. It's useful for having generic importers or exporters, or having libraries, frameworks that create infrastructure services like component infrastructures or, or persistence infrastructure. But then and there are... Yeah? It's, it's one of the big advantages uh, Java had over uh, C++, for example. Yeah. And more <coughs> modern server infrastructures and also frameworks like Spring or Java E can't just can't work without this in place and more recent features like uh, dynamic proxies for example uh, even add more to this and uh, in, in that uh, in this case you can have dynamically uh, dynamically react to method calls just as you can in uh, small talk for example so it's sort of uh, a more dynamic type system even though there is still a static type uh, for the for the compiler in place. Exactly. The, so it's a very powerful feature that goes way beyond what C++ has. C++ provides things like checks, is this the same type as that at runtime? But Java goes way beyond that by allowing um, re-access to the fields, to the, the possibility to call operations by name, 
creating dynamic proxies or well annotations are new this is what Java and C Sharp and the family of languages provide as services but then there are other languages that go way beyond that Lisp has that and um, Ruby has that sort of thing um, Smalltalk as well these languages allow you to modify your types at runtime so you can say I'd like to have a new type and then I'd like to add this method and I'd like to add that operation and then I'd like to add this field and um, you can provide so you, know, you can create and modify the types at runtime types are objects just as any other object and this is what true what, what true reflection really means when and that allows that is the basis for powerful frameworks such as Ruby on Rails so again, it proves our point that typing really defines the expressiveness of language and uh, what you can actually do with it. Yeah, this sort of um, modifying reflective capabilities were left out of Java consciously because the creators of Java deemed them to be, well, too powerful a tool to, to give to developers because they allowed code to be very complicated they allowed people to destroy the inner workings of the language, sort of. And yes, they are very powerful, very sharp tools, which allow you to do much damage. But then this is a trade-off. The more expressive the language is, the more um, you can do with the language, the more trouble you can get yourself into. And uh, also, probably one of the reasons is that Java is really concerned about security and uh, it's hard to tell what is actually going on if you allow this kind of, of things. Okay. That's true. Yeah, that's so, true. Yeah. So next point would be type inference. And this is also something that is quite interesting and is mostly seen nowadays in functional languages. Basically, the idea is that you don't need to declare the types anymore. And this is somehow strange if you compare it to uh, usual object-oriented languages where every variable has a type assigned. And what you do instead is that you have the compiler or whatever in fear the actual type of something. So you try to do an operation on something and Looking at the code, the question is whether you can infer that this operation will work because this thing that you're passing to this operation is of a certain type. So if you say, for example, a equals a plus 1, you know that a must be uh, an int or integer or some kind of number. And looking around, you could now try to figure out whether the A that you're talking about at the moment is really a number in all cases. And this is sort of a, a complete, again, a proof on the correctness of the program. And this time, without you having to declare any uh, additional stuff. So it's more automatic. So type inference is really a mechanism for static typing. It is, a, it is about analyzing the code at compile time and get as much information about the types out of the code as possible so that the compiler ensures type consistency without receiving or without needing many hints from the programmer. The idea is that the compiler uses whatever information there is without help from, from the programmer, wherever that is possible. And actually this concept can go a long way. It is um, possible to, to have programming languages that more or less entirely rely on type inference. Haskell is an example of this a powerful statically typed um, functional language where basically most types most type information is derived, is inferred from, from the code that is there. And strangely, or for the type inference is mostly used in functional languages, so it's not really common in object-oriented languages. Actually, I'm not really aware of 
any real object or anything language that uses type interference. I think there was a strong talk that uh, sort of tried that with a small talk, but that's the only thing that I'm aware of. Well, there are the new features of C Sharp 3, and in C Sharp 3, there are quite mm. a few um, things going on towards type inference. Yeah, well, I think that about wraps it up for this episode. Yeah. Is there anything else you would you think we should say? Anything else you think our readers should hear in this episode about types and type systems? Uh, well, uh, thanks for listening. Definitely, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. We did. Hear you next time. Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. If you want to get more information about Software Engineering Radio or if you want to give us feedback, please go to our website at se-radio.net. You can also contact the team at team at se-radio.net, although we prefer entries in our comments system on the website so other people can see what you think. Software Engineering Radio wants to thank Henning Pauli for the intro and outro music, as well as Lipson for providing the bandwidth. This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, is licensed under Creative Commons license. See the Software Engineering Radio website for details.